Howdy, everybody. This is Chuck, and welcome to this weekend Stuff You Should Know Selects episode. Uh, this week, I am picking How Cockroaches Work from August 15th, 2013. You have heard Josh and I debate over the years about cockroaches, the fact that they are one of the few insects that I will stomp and kill with great enthusiasm, whereas I believe Josh is on the record as saying he'll, he will not, and he will try and relocate them. Crazy talk to me. That cockroach will do nothing but spend the rest of its life trying to get back in your home to poop all over your stuff. So uh, this is a good episode, though. Uh, How cockroaches work. Enjoy it right now. Welcome to Stuff You Should Know from HowStuffWorks.com. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh Clark, and Charles W. Chuck Bryan is with me. He's got his glasses on. He's got his hair shorn. His fingernails are chewed down to the quick. He's ready to go. <laughs> I was hoping we could open the show with La Cucaracha playing in the background. Go ahead. Well. Oh, yeah, we can't. I don't know if we can or not. Well, we, we probably can't. No, there's no way we can't. Well, hold on. Let's uh, let's hum it. We could probably do that, right? That's lame. People just imagine in your heads that you're sipping a margarita and some mariachi band is playing La Cucaracha right now. Not to be confused with tequila. No. Which is similar. No. I always <laughs> confuse the two. Really? Well, not when I hear them, but like if I think of La Cucaracha, like I often think of Pee Wee dancing on the bar. Right. Then I'm like, oh, yeah, that's tequila. Right. But uh, you know what Luca- La Cucaracha is about? I assumed cockroaches, but probably not. No, a cockroach who's lost one of his legs and is having a hard time. Oh, really? Yeah. Just huh. found that out today. I did not know that. Look at me. Learning. I didn't either until like just a few hours ago, Chuck. I was once like you. <laughs> <laughs> Naive to the way of La Cucaracha. Right. All right. So we talked about La Cucaracha as you'd hoped. You feel good? Yeah. Have you ever seen the, uh, the X-Files episode with the cockroaches? I don't. No. Oh, it is perfect. It's one of the top five, and it's not even like a part the of the canon. yeah part of the big bigger picture ones. It's like its own thing. Yeah, they have the a name for those episodes. I can't remember what it's called, but like when it's just about a shapeshifter and it has nothing to do with right the uh, the overarching conspiracy. Yeah, it's one of those. Yeah, and it's just about cockroaches and a cockroach infestation I that definitely may or may not, not exist. But at one point, like, it's getting really, like, the cockroaches are everywhere and, like, everybody's starting to go a little crazy and all that. Uh-huh. And they they um, digitized a cockroach, like, crawling across your TV screen. Like, obviously not part of the yeah. scene. And it looks like it was on your screen. So, like, you're... Oh, wow. Now it looks like there's a cockroach in your house. Oh, that's awesome. It was... It was... It's a good episode. Yeah, I was late on The X-Files. I didn't watch it when it was out. And then when I moved to New Jersey, they started doing reruns and... Justin, I was living with the time, was mm-hmm. like, you never watched X-Files? <laughs> I was like, no. And then it was on every night. So yeah. I, oh, yeah. Like, I watched the crap out of it. That Did you see the Charles Nelson Riley one? Where he's like an artist. It's Jose Chung's From Outer Space. I don't remember that. Where one. like Jesse the Body Ventura and Alex Trebek are in it. Really? I didn't. Oh, see- Chuck. I must not have seen them all because I was catching them in reruns. You didn't see like some of the best ones. All right. Go see. Go watch those two. Okay. I know you have access to them. All right. Okay. Done. So, um, we're talking cockroaches here. That's and right. apparently also Jesse the Body Ventura. Yeah. Um, did you know, Chuck, that cockroaches are extremely clean insects? Well, we said the same thing about vultures. They are personally clean. Apparently, they do track a lot of germs, spread disease. They apparently leave a trail of fecal material everywhere they go because it's like a, a bit of breadcrumbs for them to follow back. Yeah, they spread bacteria, of course. Yeah, in that fecal material, um, there are proteins that set off up to 60% of allergy sufferers' allergies. Yeah, they'll eat garbage and waste. <clears throat> they'll, yeah. they'll crawl on poop that your dog laid down in the yard and eat it if your dog doesn't eat it first. And yet... A cockroach itself is very clean because they're extremely um, intense groomers. Oh, really? First of all, they keep their antenna clean because they sure. have a fatty secretion, Ugh. or some sort of secretion 
that if they don't clean it off, will block their antenna from sensing things. Yeah. So they constantly clean their antenna. But apparently they also clean their feet and everything. Uh-huh. And I read about a study. It was just a pretty almost anecdotal. It was so outside of the the scientific method. Yeah. But um, they took a swab from a guy's hands mm-hmm. who hadn't washed his hands for two hours. And they took a swab off of the foot or tarsus, I should say, yeah. of a cockroach who had been walking through garbage, and then two hours later they took a swab. And um, they put it in culture, and the guy grew way more bacteria than the cockroach's culture did. Don't care. Which means <laughs> that that man is dirtier than a cockroach. I don't care. They they proved it. I would still smash the cockroach with my flip-flop. See, I don't believe... There's a, there's a sect out there, and I don't know if it's Hinduism or Jainism. It's one of those two. Where the the monks of this sect mm-hmm. um, carry little brooms, hand brooms, to kind of brush everything off in, wherever they sit, yeah. so they don't accidentally kill even the tiniest thing. That's great, and I I kind of agree with that. I think everything has a right to life. Now you have been on record on this very show talking about killing cockroaches because of the mm-hmm. way they skitter. No, 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 not cockroaches. I I am down with killing mosquitoes and ticks. No, you talked about cockroaches. I don't kill cockroaches. You talked very much about how fast they are and how they skitter and how that freaks you out. I don't kill I them. No, I don't kill roaches. <laughs> I'm telling you, like I defy you to find the timestamp. All right, somebody, please help me. Okay, um, I will kill the crap out of a mosquito. Yeah, a cockroach, and. Um, I will generally shoo a fly. No, I'll kill flies. I, I, I generally won't kill a fly because they're not a big problem. But um, you don't have flies around you all the time. No, like me. No. Huh. But um, mosquitoes and cockroaches, I will kill, and that's about it. Yeah. Everything else, right to life. Cockroaches, you must die. <laughs> <laughs> so cockroaches are. Um, I guess they understand that Chuck wants them to die. Many people do. They're very disliked. Right. Yeah. Which has possibly accounted for them evolving to be really difficult to kill. For one, they're nocturnal. Yeah. So they're hiding away from us when we're up because we're diurnal. Sure. Which is the opposite of nocturnal. Yeah. Um, they have sensors, little sensors in their... Um, yeah, we'll get to that. Oh, okay. That's a spoiler. They run really fast. They do. They reproduce extremely quickly. Yeah. And there's more than 4,000 species of cockroach. So you would think the whole world would be infested with cockroaches, but not true. It's actually mainly just one species, the German cockroach, that is uh, accountable for most infestations in homes around the world. That's right. That is one of the four main species that you might see. The German, the American, a.k.a. palmetto bug, which are they can get big. Oh, yeah, man. Creepy. There's one man that, like in South America, it's like as big as your hand. Six inches long, one foot wing diameter, <laughs> wingspan. Uh, the brown banded cockroach and the oriental cockroach mm-hmm. um, are the four that you're likely to come across in your life. And the German cockroach and American are the ones you're going to see here in the United States. Yeah, and they have been brought here by you because they get they, you know they're not obviously going to fly from continent to continent. They hitch rides on airplanes and boats and get in shipping containers and... In your mouth. Moving boxes and uh, grocery bags. And they are ubiquitous and they, uh, like all insects or most insects, they do a service. Most of them are going to be out in the woods, like chewing stuff and pooping it out and being a part of the ecosystem. Yeah. Um, but it's the ones in the home that really freak people out. Right. And Chuck, uh, I think one of the more fascinating things, and by the way, roaches turn out to be pretty fascinating, even more than I expected. I just thought there were a few things that were fascinating. Were you creeped out like reading this or do you no, just, no, no, no. Like, so like it's that. not like that. You just hate them. Yeah. I mean, they're, it's like you previously talked about that you deny. It's the way they move and how fast they are is what creeps me out. And like, there's no greater fear than laying in bed and seeing one on the ceiling above you. <laughs> Just waiting for it to fall into your mouth. Yeah, but apparently they are pretty good at not falling off of the ceiling. That's true. Um, And they've had a a long time to practice this kind of stuff. 
They've been around for about 320 million years. What? Longer than dinosaurs? Way longer than dinosaurs. They survived that extinction event? They did. And we'll, well, let's talk about it, Chuck. Just how much of an extinction event can a cockroach survive? Can they survive a nuclear fallout, a nuclear war that would kill all humans? Could a cockroach survive as they are rumored to? Uh, maybe. <laughs> That's a, sadly, it's like, we don't know because that hasn't happened. Yeah. Oh, no, not sadly. Thankfully, that hasn't happened. <laughs> sadly. <laughs> but, um, the answer is some people say maybe, some people say maybe not. Um, what we definitely know is they probably could not survive the nu- nuclear winter. Yeah. Because, uh, they like warm, moist places. Right. And so a nuclear winter would not be good for cockroaches. Apparently, they're less susceptible to radiation poisoning yeah. than humans are, but more than most insects. So as far as insects goes, they might not be the best candidate. Right. Uh, yeah. So maybe, but probably not. Okay. I'm kind of on that side that they probably wouldn't survive a nuclear war. So we're talking about radiation, though, not like the the blast. Obviously, that would kill everything. Sure. You know. Um, all right. So they su- survived the dinosaurs extinction event. Mm-hmm. They have been around for 320 million years. They are very hardy little insects. Let's talk a little bit about their bodies. Their creepy little crunchy bodies. So um, <laughs> most of them are between two inch, half an inch and two inches long. Yeah. They're brown or black usually. Yeah. And that length is minus their antenna. This is just their body size. Sure. You don't count the antenna. And their heads point downward, mm-hmm. like as Tracy Wilson, who wrote this article, points out, almost as if they're built for ramming. Yeah, or just searching for stuff. You know, that's another way to look at it. The males are the ones that have wings. Females may have wings, but they're vestigial wings. They can't fly with them. Uh, males can fly. Not very well, though. Which makes them even more horrific when a palmetto bug, a big one's flying at your face. Because you know he has no control. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. It's sort of like the cicada. Like they're, yeah. I don't think their win- wings were made for flying, but if they jump off of something high, they can help them a little bit uh, to glide, perhaps, and not like hit the ground as hard. Right. Um, Short distances, basically. And they're, uh, they're insects. Which means that they have three main po- body regions, the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. They have an exoskeleton that they molt as they grow. And they molt a number of times, depending on the cockroach species, yeah. over the course of a couple of weeks or over the course of a couple of years. And their lifespans also are um, uh, in step with that molting schedule. Yeah. Um, but they, a cockroach will molt several times over its life before it becomes an adult. Yes. And when they molt, um, it's the same thing as when they're born. They're going to look white. Mm-hmm. And um, that's probably kind of creepy looking. I've never seen a molted cockroach. It's like a skinless cockroach. It's <laughs> like uh, the lady in Hellraiser before she <laughs> fully gets all of her skin. Right. Uh, and uh, they're they're pretty susceptible to injury and death. Obviously, when bet- when after they've molted, before bursicon, which is a hormone, makes their exoskeleton hard and dark once again. Then they have their little armor, um, which is no match for a flip flop. By the way. <laughs> Uh, they can regrow lost limbs when it molts, which is pretty cool. Mm-hmm. And they can even put molting off for a little while in order to regrow a lost limb. Right. Um, in their head, let's go over their head. They have eyes and their antenna, which we've talked about, yep. which we'll get into more specifically. And their, uh, Tracy loves saying mouth parts. Yeah. She writes a lot of these articles. Yeah. She, she, uh, will never just say mouths. Uh, it's always it's, mouth parts. It's, yeah. It's not a true mouth, apparently. It's, yeah. A mouth part. Yeah. Uh, they do have brains, by the way. <clears throat> and they are. The brain is in the head, but the brain is not like a human or a mammal brain. It's not doing – it's like it's not connected to a big central nervous system or anything like that. Right. There is a central nervous system, but it's not in the head. Um, there's a uh, – it's some sort of ganglia um, that allows the roach to continue living for up to a week after it loses its head. Yeah, this is a pretty good roach fact. Okay. I right. think. Okay. Um, so you can cut a roach's head off. Yep. And it will live for a week and do all the normal things that a roach does yeah. for a week. And then when it finally dies, it dies because of? Thirst. Yeah. Yeah, because they, they actually breathe. They don't breathe through the nose and mouth. They breathe through their sides. There's little holes in their side called spiracles. Yeah. And uh, trachea tubes deliver the oxygen to the organs and tissues through their sides. So there's, uh, you know, cut off the head and it just dies of thirst. Yeah. Which is my new favorite game. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, that's not true because that's like 
future serial killer stuff. It is. Like you torture cockroaches and you torture animals and you torture humans. Yeah. That's Once like you've moved on to chipmunks, it's probably yeah. you're beyond the point of no return. You're a bad person. Jeffrey Dahmer tortured animals. Oh, yeah. He's, he would lay down and uh, like he would come across a dead deer in the forest and like lay down with it and spoon with it. That's like uh, Johnny Depp and Dead Man. Did he do that? He did the exact same thing. Oh, well, maybe he was a serial killer. I don't think he was. No. He was a killer, but not a serial killer. That just shows how messed up Dahmer was, though, man. Yeah. To, like, that was a connection to him, was, like, h- holding this dead animal. Mm-hmm. The cockroaches. Um, so that's the head? Yeah. Let's talk about their eyes. Their eyes are compound eyes. Um, so they see the world in a mosaic. Like a fly? Like a fly. All right. So we talked about their eyes. <laughs> I, I I actually asked Tracy today. I was like, you, you wrote a bunch of insect articles. Yeah. Didn't you ever get sick about talking about the head, the abdomen, the thorax? Mouth parts. The mouth parts. <laughs> the legs. They're all the same for insects. She's What'd like, she say? Oh, no, they're not. They all have these, they're all the same, but they all have different little adaptations that make them different. I was like, how did you not get tired of it? Huh. She said she was fascinated the whole time. She said Xanax. <laughs> <laughs> That's Tracy. <Animal> nitrate. <laughs> That's uh, Tracy of uh, Stuff You Miss in History Class, by the way. Yeah. Plug, plug. Xanax. Um, so we talked about the antenna. They are movable and they are known as antennal flagella and, uh, they're actually tiny, tiny little hair covered segments and like it's, it's thicker where it attaches at the head and it gets thinner and thinner and thinner until it's just like a human hair almost at the end. Yeah. And these things sense, um, they smell sort of right. Yeah. They, they basically, I guess, uh, sense pheromones. Yeah. The, the, there you have it. <laughs> they sense pheromones. They, uh, pick up odors. I think they, uh, they're pretty finely attuned to the environment. Yeah, but that's like really how they're getting around. Yeah. Right. Like e- even though they have eyes, isn't the antenna really the secret? I believe so. Okay. Um, Chuck, you want to talk about mouth parts? Yes. <laughs> um, they are a lot different than mammals, as Tracy points out. Um, but they do have parts that sort of are akin to how mammals' mouths work. For instance, there's a labrum and labium, and they form the lips. Right. Uh, mandibles, there's two of those, and they uh, cut and grind things like your teeth might. Which is very important because roaches eat literally anything. Yeah. And sometimes that's like wood and other stuff yeah. that like, they shouldn't be able to eat, but they can. That's right. Go ahead. Thanks to the mandibles and some other things that we'll get to. Right. Uh, and then that's they have why a- I stop. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's a couple of maxilla, and they um, – basically m- manipulate the food they it's turn sort of it like around a, a chewing yeah like, like a, a squirrel yeah squirrel's arms or hands yeah or a dung beetle yeah <laughs> uh the thorax which is one of the body parts one of the three pieces of the body mm-hmm. um and that has the three pairs of legs and the wings and the legs are so named after the part of the thorax that they're attached to right so you get the pro the meso and the meta yeah so the pro is closest to the head, meso, middle. Yeah, the pro are like the brakes, apparently. Right. And the, yeah, the pro, yeah, that's, they just do stopping. Yeah. The middle ones can make the roach go forward or backward. Mm-hmm. And then, so that's the mesothoracic legs. Then the metathoracic legs, the ones in the rear, yeah. are the ones that propel the roach forward. Yeah. And here's another good roach fact. You take this one, man. <laughs> it is awesome. Uh, they can move about 50 body lengths in a second. Which is... Up to three miles an hour. Sounds very slow to us. Yeah. But think about this in roach terms. That's right. If that were a human being, uh, that would mean we would be running 200 miles an hour. Yeah. That's why they look so fast. It's because they are. They are fast. Now, like to us, three miles an hour is not that much. That's but a very slow walk. That equals 200 miles an hour in reality for us. Yeah. And part two of that roach fact, which I think is just horrifying, 
when a roach runs really, really fast, sometimes it it gets air and just is basically running on its back legs only. <laughs> but the front, the other legs are still moving, so that's just like my worst nightmare. Yeah, they're coming after you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Man. So they, uh, the three pairs are all built the exact same. They all have the same parts, but they, they are different lengths. They function slightly differently. Yeah. Um, and, but they all move the same way. It just depends on, you know, what the roach wants to do. Like we said, the prothoracic legs act as brakes. Yeah. The mesothoracic, um, can move it forward or back. And then the, the meta push it forward. And, and they apparently move like pogo sticks. Yeah. Up and, and then, down and back and forth. And then back and forth, too. Yeah. And they work in conjunction to allow the roach to kind of walk over just about anything. So um, when the, the the pro and meta thoracic legs on one side are moving, the mesothoracic leg, the middle one, on the other side is moving. Yeah. So that's how they move, which apparently... It's like a little ATV. It's like a 4 by 4 Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> Uh, she also points out that there are, um, the parts of the leg you can sort of approximate as if it were a human. Yeah. Uh, they have a trochanter that's like our knees, uh, femur and tibia, um, resemble our thigh and shins. And then they have the tarsus, which is the ankle and foot. Right. And the tarsus is hooked in a roach, which allows it to walk on the ceiling (laughs) over your head. Most frightening thing ever. And on walls. Sure. And uh, when a roach is on the ground, it runs very quickly. But when it's on a ceiling, it moves much more methodically because it it's doesn't like, want to oh, fall. Oh, I'm upside down. Yeah. If three miles an hour equals 200 miles an hour to us, yeah. imagine what a 10-foot drop equals to a poor little roach. Well, not enough because it lands, flips itself over, and then yeah. runs away again. But it's humiliated. That's true. Uh, 27 times per second, these legs can move back and forth. So. These are fast, fast little boogers. Yeah. Uh, which is why you previously talked about hating them because they were so fast and I, scary. I, I really, <laughs> I don't. Oh, I'm going to find it. Okay. I'll bet I didn't say I'd kill them. I'm I've find long it. advocated for Roach's rights. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So now we're at the abdomen. Um, they do have a heart. It is a tube like in structure and does move blood along, but it does not carry, um, Oxygen around. So, A, the blood is not red, and B, they move oxygen and blood around in other ways. Right. Through basically empty spaces called hemo, hemocoles. Yeah. It's pretty much the absence of a fact there. Yeah. Well, it's an, the aorta carries blood around to the organs, but yeah, she says the blood just travels through these spaces, right. essentially. And then rather than having to worry about like a spare tire or something like that. Oh, like a fat belly, right? Yeah. They have a actual fat body, yeah, and it's just this little area where they store all the fat in their body. Yeah, very smart. I have that same place. <laughs> it's between my chin and my waist. Yeah, I guess they do have to worry about a spare tire, but yeah. it's a very specific one. Yeah, that's true. You know, okay. So let's talk about digestion. Um, the the digestive system is in the abdomen. And it's really not super unlike, it's just like a simplified version of our own or any mammal's digestive system. All right. But like you said, they can eat things like, and digest things like wood and cellulose. So they do need some help from specialized parts. Yeah. Uh, one of which is called a crop. Right. That's, um, it basically holds the food while a, a part behind it, um, a toothy section in the digestive <laughs> tract. So gross. The, the, that is gross, and uh, it's equal to like a um, an octopus having a beak. Oh, a yeah. crushing beak. Blech. They're squishy. <laughs> They're not supposed to have a hard beak in the middle. It's crazy. Yeah, it's called a proventriculus on the roach, and that just pulverizes the stuff, like right. wood or whatever. It's tough to digest. And then uh, and then it pushes it back, this, this pulverized part, to the gastric cassia, which um, houses enzymes, microbes, things that break it down even further. Yeah. And all this is just preliminary stuff. This is like what we do in our mouth. Yeah. Um, it, all this is going through this process in a roach before it even gets to the part where it starts to digest. Yeah. Man. This this is sort of gross, like the digestion one was. We haven't said the word bolus yet. No. Well, we just did. <laughs> uh, and then the Circe that we talked about earlier, these are the... Uh, 
it sort of looks like short little antenna sticking out from the butt area mm-hmm. on each side. Mm-hmm. And this is what allows the roach to not get – like whenever you go to get that flip-flop – and you rear back and go to hit the roach, and as you're coming it, it just like darts out of the way. You're like, how did it know? How did it know? It's because the Cersei, they, they pick up on airflow, mm-hmm. and they can actually feel and sense that shoe coming. So if you're, if you're into killing roaches like me, you have to be swift and, and stealthy. And, uh, yeah, Come at it hard and with vigor. And with a, I guess a paddle that has holes in it. Cut oh, down dude. air. Hey, maybe so. Drag. You might be onto something there. Oh no! <laughs> you invented Sharknado. <laughs> so uh, the roach paddle. <laughs> um, so I guess so. That's a roach. That's the roach's body. Now let's talk about reproduction. Hey, because they do reproduce depending on the species. Um, I believe uh, the German roach uh, can produce something in the order of like. 80,000 offspring? Is that correct? No, way more than that. Uh, the German produces three, the German cockroach and its offspring okay. will eventually produce about 300,000 per year. So a mother and a, her, her kids. Yeah, like that, the family tree from that one cockroach will eventually number 300,000 in a year. Right, but think about this. Then one of those kids, and then her offspring will be another 300,000. No, I think that counts. I think that's the whole. Okay. Kit- well, then know. one of those 300,000 will have more kids and another 300,000. <laughs> it, it goes exponentially. It kicks in somewhere. Exponentiality kicks in at some point. Yeah, and American cockroaches only produce about 800 babies a year. So I got something from, believe it or not, the Orkin website. Has a lot of really good scientific information. I saw that. Uh, did you go and look at it? Mm-hmm. Uh, and they talked about female courtship. Um, they begin courtship, it says, by raising their wings and exposing their internal membranes and expanding their <laughs> genital chamber. Hey, boys, check out my internal <laughs> membrane. Exactly. My genital chamber is wide open and ready. Uh, I'm going to release a pheromone. <laughs> hey, man, this is science. This is science. <laughs> Uh, they release the pheromones to attract males, and um, that's the calling position. And then the males that, that pick up on these pheromones approach the female. They flap their wings a little bit to say, hey, I like what you got cooking there. <laughs> and then mating commences, it says, when a male cockroach backs into a female cockroach and deposits sperm. So a little, little like, uh, you know, it's from the rear to the rear. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Let's go back to reproduction. Yeah, we used to be really good at stuff like this. And by the way, wasps will actually, this is just a side note, wasps will actually sting cockroaches and lay eggs inside of a cockroach. Yeah. <laughs> like baby wasps can be born out of a cockroach body. Right. They incubate in the roach and I guess probably eat it alive from the inside out. There's a movie. I'm just going to start saying that about everything. <laughs> <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> So there's a couple of ways that a mother roach, once uh, her eggs are fertilized, can uh, produce offspring. Um, and a couple of them involve something with one of the worst words ever, in my opinion, the Uthika. O-O-T-H-E-C-A. Yeah, the Uthika. You've never been to Uthika? <laughs> it's nice. I prefer Uthika. Upstate Uthika. So that's basically just like an egg sack yeah. that the eggs develop in. And it can either be inside the mom, which makes her ovoviviparous. Ovoviviparous. Seriously, that's the word. Yeah, ovoviviparous. Paris. Or it can be on the outside of her, which makes her oviparous. And if it's oviparous, then she can just kind of like abandon the sack. Yeah. Cover it up with some newspaper or something like that. Sometimes. And say, good luck. Or some of them, it depends on the species, uh, carry that around with them. And then actually care for the young after they're born, like right. a good mom should. And then there's viviparous, which is basically like eggs developing in fluid, yeah. like in a human. In the uterus. And in ovoviviparous and oviviparous, or I'm sorry, viviparous. Yeah. <laughs> Are you confused yet? No. Imagine following along with the, just your ears. I know, at I'm, this I'm looking at words, so it helps. Um, the eggs are born, or the young come out 
live. Yeah, they actually give birth to little baby cockroaches. Right. <laughs> so, uh, like we said, the German cockroach can produce 300,000 offspring. The German cockroach and her offspring. Yeah. Can produce 300,000 cockroaches in a year. Um, and then the Americans, 800. Yeah, it's not many. And we talked about nymphs. Apparently, the nymph, when it's born, is fleck of dust size, maybe. Oh, really? Very, very small. Um, and there's a bunch of them, don't forget. Yeah. So, uh, and they're white. They're waiting to molt. They're very, um, Easy to kill. Yes. <laughs> and if you're a common centipede, you love to eat these things. Yeah. Imagine seeing that on a, a microscopic level. A centipede eating baby cockroaches. Yeah. There's that's, a movie for you. That's right. <laughs> um, also, here's another good roach fact is some mothers that care for their offspring after birth, some of them just, you know, either dump the, the uthika or they just have the babies and leave. But some actually raise their little babies. And scientists believe that they the offspring actually recognize the mother. Yeah. Just, I don't understand why that's so hard to believe. Well, because it's an insect, man. It just seems like a very mammalian – or not even mammalian. Just like it doesn't seem like something from the insect world. It like gives them a, a heart that I previously yes. didn't believe. <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah. Up with cockroaches. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It just puts a face on them that I never really considered as I smashed them. Right. Because you can't see their face. That's right. Um, and cockroaches, if you want to make them a little more um, human-like, a little more personable. Okay. Get them a little hat and a cane. They're social. <laughs> oh, yeah. They, they're not. They, they're related to termites, it turns out. And actually, I've read a fascinating fact. I read one of the best magazine articles I've ever read in my life. And I've read a lot of magazine articles. Yeah. In the most recent issue, I believe it was, of Harper's. And it's about... Ten ways to satisfy your man? No. <laughs> it's early... It's an article about the early mycologists who discovered... Westerners, I should say, who discovered... I'm making air quotes, like magic mushrooms. Yeah. And the, in between that time and the time they became outlawed... Right. And then what happened after they became outlawed and how there were all these outlaw, like, fungal experts who all had, like, PhDs and doctorates, but were also, like, might as well have just been bikers growing these huge crops of yeah. mushrooms. Um, and there's a murder involved and all that. But there's this, it's an awesome article. Check it out. All right. But, um, there's this one fact in there that there's a type of fungus that has evolved to mimic termite eggs so perfectly that it can fool a termite into thinking it's her own eggs, and termites um, salivate on their eggs to keep them moist constantly. Uh -huh. um, and this fungus needs to be kept moist. So it'll be kept moist by a termite that thinks this fungus wow. is one of her eggs. Does that fungus then later on kill the termite? Probably. Okay, because that would be, I believe that's irony. Yeah. Even though we've been told we misused that yeah. word. <laughs> Thanks for the ride, lady. Um, wow, we should do one on termites. Okay, well, I say that because apparently roach eggs need to be kept moist as well. Yes, they do. I don't know. Do they regurgitate on them to do so? Uh-huh. Okay. They salivate on them. Well, another way they're related to termites are they, they like to hang out together. They like to live in groups. Uh, where they differ is termites actually have, sort of like bees, they have very specific roles in their colonies and a social structure that's very organized. Cockroaches ain't like that. They ain't like that, but they still like to hang out with one another. And... um they actually make decisions like collectively together on where they want to uh, roost. Right. You know? Which is an emergent system, right? I think so. Is that what that's called? Yeah. Yeah, they've done studies where they found um, <laughs> like big, large numbers of cockroaches. If they <clears throat> don't have enough space, they actually divide up. Evenly. Yeah, into like the smallest number of spaces they can go. Like, well, there's 200 of us, so let's divide up into three groups and go to three different places. Right. And you go, you guys go there, we'll go there, and we'll go here. Right. And there's always one dude, the, well, the, odd, the cockroach out. It's like, what about me? <laughs> that would be a Pixar movie. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's a good one. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they're, they're also social in that they follow one another, although not necessarily a leader, but the, I guess whoever they think has the best idea at the, the time. The collective conscious. Yes. Yes. And there was a, uh, a group of uh, scientists that created something called InsBot. And it is a robotic cockroach, and they coated it with 
cockroach pheromones and introduced it to a colony of roaches that accepted it. And then they started to mess with the roaches. Of course. They had um, Innsbot lead them out into daylight so that they abandoned their nocturnality. Uh-huh. Um, they would wander out in the open following this thing. He got them to move. Um, and he uh, brought them fire. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> Man, I was like, this is getting good. That reminds me of the, um, I know I talk about Errol Morris ad nauseum, yeah. but fast, cheap, and out of control. Yeah. Is, uh, the robot scientist makes robots that mimic cockroaches and other small bugs. That's really neat. And he said one potential application one day is to have like, to imagine like mm-hmm. thousands of these that clean things. Like these robot bugs that you own. Well, you just yeah. like hit a button and like 200 of them will dust your television and then go back to their little place. That is pretty neat. Yeah. It's like scrubbing bubbles. Yeah. Or like the X-Files when it went across the TV. Yeah. That roach wasn't cleaning anything though. What's scrubbing bubbles? It's like a type of a uh, cleaner. It is? Yeah. All right. Is that a plug? I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> it was just a free association. All right. So let's get to, let's say you're like me and not like Josh and you don't want roaches in your home. I don't want roaches in my home. It's <laughs> just, just when I see a roach, I will, I will gingerly pick it up with a paper towel and toss it outside. I oh, I'm sure that doesn't it. injure the, at all, huh? It doesn't. Okay. No, no, I don't squeeze it at all. I just very gently, like. All right. What happens if that roach like gets free and crawls up your arm, up your then shirt I go, sleeve? Yeah. <laughs> okay. But I hopefully am doing it outside. All right. I just want to see where it stops. I'm trying to get a you know, feel out your position fully. Um. If if it's injured, if I accidentally injure it, I'll go ahead and kill it. Okay. Boy, that's really you're quite the humanitarian. Or insectarian. I'm an insectarian. <laughs> so let's say you you don't want roaches in your house, which is pretty much everybody. They say the first thing to do is try and seal it off. Yeah. Good luck with that because roaches can fit into uh, cracks that are as small as one sixteenth of an inch. Yeah. One point five millimeters, and just show me a house that doesn't have, or at least maybe some new houses. You might have some luck, but if you live in an old house like me, there's there's always cracks. Sure. Like animals can get through these cracks. So, if you realize you've got a bunch of cracks, seal them up as best you can. Yeah. But if that's still not doing the trick, um, they say that you want to go with a bait trap. Yeah. Rather than a spray. Because you, when you use a bait trap, you become like a, a pioneer tracker. Sure. Um, you can put the trap somewhere, and if it's not attracting roaches, even though you know you have roaches. Yeah. Um, then Moving you around. need to move your trap. Yeah. And when you move your trap and start attracting roaches, then you can tell where they're coming from. Then you can seal up those cracks. That's right. You you come to know the roaches using the traps. Yeah. With a spray, it's just like you're just spraying blindly. Did we do one on fleas or just ticks? Just ticks. We need to do fleas too because okay. I have battled fleas. Okay. Um, They say don't use, like, don't waste your money on those sound devices. They say those don't work. Yeah. That emit, like, some, like, sound that only a roach can hear. Right. Um, you want to keep your house clean? Yeah, you keep your house clean anyway. Tracy, uh, <laughs> if you've ever seen uh, The Simpsons where Marge and Homer lose the kids and have to go take oh, a yeah. parenting class, that's, that that's what this paragraph reminds me of. <laughs> About, yeah. yeah, mop up after every meal. Exactly. Uh, clean and seal all of your food or cover and seal it. Uh, wipe down counters and tables after eating. Sweep or mop your floor after cooking. Eat only in your dining area. I guess if you eat over your sink, run the water afterward to clean out any crumbs that may have dropped out of your mouth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and as a last resort, you could use poisons, but I would never recommend that, yeah. putting poisons in your household. Yeah. Um, you can always call your friendly neighborhood uh, exterminator, and they'll take care of it for you. Sure. You know? If or you can call an insbot. And he can lead all the cockroaches out like the Pied Piper. Uh, there are a few natural things, though. Yeah, some things have been shown to work. Yeah. Uh, Nepa talic tone. Mm-hmm. It's in two forms of catnip. So if you have a cat, you might just kill two birds with one stone. Yeah. <laughs> um, a cineole, cineole um, also known as eucalyptol, and that is in bay leaf. Yeah. And then osage orange oil. 
and they don't know what in that is the the magic potion, but apparently that works. Yeah. So if you're into natural, you could try some of those things. Just put bay leaves and catnip all over the place. Yeah. See what happens. And orange oil. And you'll never have a roach again. Or you can just clean up your house. I don't see many roaches. It's good. I mean, I'm surprised with the amount of moisture and how old my house is and how, like, the fact that I eat all over my house and spill things everywhere. <laughs> you know? Right. Garbage laying around. There's, like, gum stuck to your floor. <laughs> yeah, but I don't see roaches much. Yeah. And when I do, I have my friend the flip-flop. I'm sure you do. And coming soon, the roach paddle. Yeah. yeah. Uh, see, I don't feel as bad because, especially after I saw those reproductive figures, I'm not putting a dent in the roach population. <laughs> Yeah, I can tell you the ones that you're killing care. I don't, I don't know. It's hard to tell with their brains smashed on the bottom of my shoe. Gross, man. <laughs> well, if you want to learn more about cockroaches, you can uh, type that word into the search bar at HowStuffWorks.com, and it'll bring up this fine article. And I said uh, search bar, which means it's time for message break. Stuff you should know. This is from uh, an Englishman who went up a hill and came down a mountain. (laughs) It's not true. Uh, A self-experimenter, though. Uh, When I was a kid, guys, about 18, actually, I noticed that when you get water up your nose, the effect is all-consuming. You can't seem to think about anything, feel anything, or do anything, Mm -hmm. except think about that water that you just sniffed up your hooter. He's English. I had a similar thought about what happens to you uh, both psychologically and physically when you get soap in your eye because that stinging sensation and the resulting fevered knuckling of the optic cavity for is for a short time the only thing in the universe. So, while laying in the bathtub uh, with the refracted sunlight sparkling through the red tint of my closed eyes contemplating this phenomena, I decided to run my own experiment. Uh, I want to know which of these all-powerful sensations would eclipse the other. So... I got a nice big chunk of soap on one finger and simultaneously rubbed it vigorously into my eye and ducked under the water, sniffing in deeply. (laughs) Jeez. The result was, as you can imagine, quite horrific. I must have looked like I was being fatally electrocuted. Uh, I thrashed and rubbed and coughed and cried. My final conclusion... Are you dying to know what happened? (laughs) Yes. ...was that unbelievably both experiences behaved in some sort of quantum mechanical way where I was all consumed by two separate all-consuming events at the same time. So basically, it sucked really bad. (laughs) Uh, If you share this information with the world, however, no one else will ever have to suffer this uh, hitherto undocumented facet of reality. All right, because the guy did that. Uh, Kind regards, James Holmes, not the maniac version, he says. Did he say that underneath? I'll bet he does have that signature. That was parenthetical, yeah. Uh, From Manchester, England. So James... I don't know why you do such a thing, sir, but um, I raise a pint to you. Okay. And thanks. Yeah. Um, isn't there like a whole movement like N plus one or N equals one? The N equals one movement. What's that? It's like self-experimentation. N is the study population. Uh-huh. And so if N equals one, there's just one person. That's you. Yourself. Yeah. I don't know about sniffing water and putting soap in your eyes, but he was a kid. He was only 18. Right. <laughs> uh, James, right? Yeah, James, uh, not the maniac version. Thanks, James. If you, uh, anyone else out there, have a cool self-experiment that you've done, we want to hear about that all the time. Cockroach story, too. Sure. Let us know. Agreed. Um, you can tweet to us at SYSK Podcast. You can join us on Facebook.com slash Stuff You Should Know. And you can join us at our home on the web, our website, StuffYouShouldKnow.com. <laughs> For more on this and thousands of other topics, visit HowStuffWorks.com. 